Good morning, afternoon, evening. Not sure when you're catching this, but hopefully you are. Now I'm ready to put the FD back together and all its AC components. I think I found the leak. We'll find out, right? But I got myself in a little bit of a pickle. I have pushed the car off the lift to do one of my comedy skits in a previous episode. Now I want the car back on the lift. But I've taken the car apart, right? The intake manifold's pulling apart. And I want to put all that together, start it, and have it take apart just to get it on top of the lift. Now I do have a winch that goes on top of my lift, but I've taken that off to allow for longer cars on the lift itself. And I, it takes a lot of trouble to put it all back together. So this is my plan. I'm gonna push the 2,900 pound car out of the garage, lower the lift, put the ramps on, and try to push the 2,900 pound car back onto the lift. Don't ever underestimate the power of laziness. Do you think an overachiever actually invented the TV remote? No, 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 no. That was a lazy person that invented this thing right here. Hopefully I don't blow out a knee. Yes! Good man, Joe. A couple episodes back, I took apart the FD's refrigerant or AC system to find a leak. I was leaking refrigerant. I thought maybe it was the condenser because I had a big dent in it. But when I took out the condenser, I can't see any evidence of a leak with that. But I still wanted to replace it with a two-pass system. I'll get more on that a little bit later in the episode. But this is still in good operating order. Maybe not in good nick, but it still works. Um, so I dug a little further. And I believe I found a leak on the low pressure line leading into the firewall. That could have been an O-ring. And then I looked a little bit further and saw the expansion valve and I could see some evidence of a leak going down the high pressure line of the expansion valve. I thought for sure that the evaporator would be bad. When cars sit for a long, long time, usually it's the evaporator that goes bad. And here's why. I'll go back to a little bit of science, but in space, you can achieve a vacuum of, what is it, 24 pounds square inch, something somewhere around there. At sea level, where we're at in Houston, maybe 17. Now I know you could probably go off the internet and kind of prove these numbers a little bit wrong, but I'm, I'm somewhere close. Perfect vacuum we consider out in space, sea level. You can't, the bottom line is you can't achieve a perfect vacuum. So that means moisture is in your system regardless. You just can't get it all out. When cars sit, that moisture reacts with the oils or the the 134r oil and creates sulfuric acid that's when you and when you let these cars sit for over a time it doesn't really matter when you drive them a lot of time because it's circulating when you're driving them right but if you let them sit for years and years and years that sulfuric acid sits at the bottom of your evaporator and this is what usually goes bad but you look at this this thing right here that's in really, really good nick. I, I, I can't see any of us. I thought it was new. I, Cause when I, I had my engine builder put this engine in, I also had him convert it over to 134. And I thought maybe he replaced the evaporator cord. Cause when I took this out, it looked so good. And this is a Denso unit and that's one of the better ones. 
but I looked at my invoices. I didn't see any replacement for an evaporator core. So I don't know. I, I'm shocked. I'm shocked at how good a shape this thing is in. And there's no evidence on the bottom of the casing of any leak from this eva evaporator. So I'm keeping an evaporator, bottom line. What we did do is take apart the lines from the expansion valve. We had to put some heat to it, quite honestly. The nuts to it, there's just two little nuts, little bolts, I guess, really, um, right there. And they go through all the way to the bottom here. Don't know if that's catching, I sure hope it is. And we had to put some heat to this right here, not flame, but actually uh, uh, electrical heat. Neat little tool, I'm gonna to get one myself. Took that apart and replaced the O-rings. When we replaced the O-rings, and I don't know where it went, oh, here we go. When I replaced the O-rings, I replaced them with these green ones because the oil in 134 systems reacts differently to the um, O-rings that were in there for the R12, and they can deteriorate the O-rings, so you wanna get these green ones for 134, right? Replace those. I'm gonna replace the O-rings as I go through on all these hoses and when I put the condenser back in. And we're just gonna see what happens. I've got good news, really bad news, and a funny story. The first, the funny story. Remember those bolts that I got from bolt.com to put on and off the blow off valve real easy? Like, that didn't happen. Even with a hex bolt on that lower bolt, there's no way you could get a wrench to it. So, and I can't make this up. What did I do? I put the original Allen wrench bolts back on and used my tool that I made to get them off to put it back on. Makes sense, I guess. The good news is everything's put back together as far as the HVAC system. I put the evaporator back on, I put the lines back on to the firewall, the condensers back in, that's all hooked up and I'm ready to evacuate the system and see if it holds a vacuum. The bad news. There's an O2 sensor wire that runs on the back of the firewall down from the top of the engine down to the exhaust manifold. It runs right by the high and low pressure lines. Even when I first looked at it, I could tell that that connection on that wire was getting pretty frayed and uh, very, very frail. So I kept on gingerly moving that wire away every time I tried to get a um, nut or a, a wrench to those lines. I guess one time I really wasn't paying good enough attention. The wrench got a hold of the wire and broke the connection between the O2 sensor and the wire. I called up Mazda and they, they of course, they had a good laugh. And so they're not gonna have that. But I did go online. I believe there's places out there, ironically, original parts of Mazda.com or something like that has them. And there's some other places, Mazda places that have these O2 sensors. So I ordered them and I even overnighted it. That's probably laughable too, given the situations where I'm really gonna get that overnight. Well, 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 we'll see. The other thing that happened was when I wanted to hook up my pump, my evacuation pump to the lines, the hourglass or the glass that shows you the oil level on the pump fell into the reservoir. It, this is 15 years old, I've got my money out of it, but I'd like to get one more use out of it or continue to use it. So I super glued this in, a lot of super glue in this episode, huh? And I'm going to put it back together, put the reservoir oil back in there and see if it works. It, it's been a clown show actually today. I've hooked up the gauges or the gauge right here. You can see that down to the high pressure line in the low pressure line, those valves are actually open right now, but these right here are closed. Put you back over here. All right, now I've got this hooked up to the pump down here. Once again, down there, I haven't turned the pump on. It seems to be holding oil, which is good. So I'm gonna start this up and open up these valves and see if I can hold a vacuum. And as you can see, the gauges are sucking down. I'll probably hit this for, I don't know, a couple minutes and then shut it off and see if I hold a vacuum. If I hold a vacuum, then I will probably evacuate the system for about an hour or so. It's been a half an hour and these needles haven't budged off their vacuum. So that's a good sign that I've actually fixed this leak and I'm holding a vacuum and everything's sealed up pretty tight. So I'm gonna evacuate the system for about an hour. 
the unfortunate thing is I cannot charge the system until I get that O2 sensor because I need to charge the system with the engine running. I can't start this car without an O2 sensor. We'll just, we'll have to pick that up tomorrow, I guess. I got my O2 sensor. Thank you to Josh out at Atkins Rotary, Eatonville, Washington for getting this to me so quickly. I really appreciate that. I don't think I'm gonna do a lot of filming in the essence of time on the video on how to put on O2 sensors and recharge the AC system. There's plenty out there on YouTube to do that, right? I wanted to drop a couple of Scott tips on you on things that may or may not been mentioned in those videos. First off, when you put on or take off an O2 sensor, you're generally using a tool that looks like this. It's got this little slot in it. And the O2 sensor goes into that, or you put this over top the O2 sensor and that wire, that slot allows that wire to travel through it. That is because, it, well, if you tried to use a wrench, open end wrench, it generally strips out the O2 sensor because they're on there pretty tight. If you try to use the box end wrench, typically the electrical end of the O2 sensor is much larger than the fitting of the O2 sensor. And you can't get the box end wrench through here. Now we don't have to worry about that on this one because that's pretty small, but generally that's what you have to do. Also, on the AC systems, we are putting our one I mean, excuse me, 134A into this system. It's an R12 system. So that means, we're, well, we're gonna lose some cooling effect from that. We, we just are, and there's reasons for that. If you compare an R12 system to an 134A system, they're going to cool relatively the same. Now, but if you can convert over a R12 system to a 134 system, you're gonna lose some cooling effects from that. And that's because this R30, I mean this 134A is at much higher pressure, right? The way they compensate that when they went over from an R12 to a 134 is they just made everything larger. All the orifices were larger, the condensers were larger, and everything like that to compensate for that higher pressure. So when you charge these systems like this, First thing, well, charging any system, quite honestly, uh, whether it's R12 that's been converted over or 134A that's been converted over, you really want to pay attention to whether or not you're going to charge it with gas or liquid. If the cylinder is upright like this, you're going to be charging as a gas. If you flip it around like this, you'll be charging as a liquid. Why that matters is you're going to go through the low port of your system. Now, if your low port goes to an accumulator, then you can charge it as a liquid because it'll dissipate it to gas when it goes through the accumulator. But if your low port goes directly to the compressor, you will destroy the compressor when you, if you charge it as a liquid. It can't change that, you can't take that as a liquid, it has to be a gas. And it really depends on how close your low port is to your compressor. To be safe, I just tell everybody, charge it as a gas. Right? It'll charge a little slower, but you know, it'll be safer. Now, from going from an R12 to a 134 system, like that, like this has been converted to, since this is a higher pressures, right, you're going to put less gas or less refrigerant into this system, all right, to the tune of about 20% less, all right? Now, I'll put a, char a chart into the video that shows you this, so you don't have to do the math, but it's about 20%. You don't want to overcharge a system. If it calls for three pounds of refrigerant R12, don't put in three pounds of 134. You're gonna put in about 80% less than that, or 20% less than that, excuse me. And I'll put the chart in there. Why don't we just get started on this? I'll take a couple of pictures on the way and put it all back together, start it up, and see if we get any cooling. Which is ironic, for the last two weeks in Houston, it's been 80 to 85 degrees consistently. Today, it's 32 degrees. I'm almost ready. So, I have, gauges were always already hooked up, right? High pressure, low pressure lines. We're still holding a vacuum. Been holding it for days, actually, that's great. Right here's the sticker that says, uh, right there, that says what pound needs to use. I think it's 1.5 pounds that goes into this and that translates over to roughly 1.1 pounds of 134. We have our tank here and it's on top of our scale. Our scale is zeroed out. 
the tank is open, the ports are open, the manifold is closed, I've purged the system through here from the tank so we won't introduce any air into it so now we just need to start the car and charge the system through the low side. It is all put back together. I cannot wait to get this back on the road. I've missed driving it so much. I've got a couple other things for it that I've ordered. I'm not gonna tell you what it is. I'll just mention two words, carbon fiber. <laughs>